begin by saying doubtless you are all aware of a certain brand of beer that has been in the news lately. It will remain nameless for the purposes of this message, but I think you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, it comes in a blue and white can. It's been the leading selling beer in America for a long time, but it's taken a hit recently in its sales based on a disastrous advertising campaign. Disastrous because I think the brewery did not at all anticipate the reaction to their advertising. They featured in that advertising a certain individual who shall also remain nameless for the purposes of this sermon. And that individual has been termed as an influencer or a social media influencer. Perhaps you're familiar with the term influencer or social media influencer. I had read that term any number of times but hadn't really given it that much thought. But in the maelstrom that followed this advertising campaign, I thought, I want, I want to understand this a little better, understand just what, what they're talking about by an uh, influencer or a social media influencer. So I did a little research and found some articles. I'd like to share some information with you as we begin this sermon. From an article in Wired magazine, The Wired Guide to Influencers, written by Paris Martineau, a staff writer for Wired Magazine. Quote, so what is an influencer really? Ostensibly, it's someone who wields influence. Open parenthesis, duh. Close parenthesis, her words, not mine. But that doesn't really match up with current usage. Influencer culture as we know it today is inextricably tied to consumerism and the rise of technology. The term is shorthand for someone or something with the power to affect the buying habits or quantifiable actions of others by uploading some form of original, often sponsored content to social media platforms like Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, or LinkedIn. Be it moody photos, cheeky video reviews, meandering blogs, or blurry soon to disappear stories, the value of the content in question is derived from the perceived authority and most importantly, authenticity of its creator. True influencerdom presupposes a particular type of relationship between content creator and viewer at scale, one that hinges on the willingness of the viewer to be influenced. Users consider influencers more akin to a close friend than an advertiser or paid endorser as the stream of content they produce and the more casual way in which it is shared with the public imbues influencers with an air of authenticity that is rarely seen in semi-commercial spaces. That from Wired Magazine, the Wired Guide to Influencers. A further article I'd like to give you a quote from was found on the Influencer Marketing Hub. This is a, uh, a business organization which helps influencers get started, keep their business going. The article is entitled, What is an Influencer? Social Media Influencers Defined by Werner Geiser, who is also co-founder of this uh, entity, the Influencer Marketing Hub. What is an influencer? An influencer is someone who has the power to affect others' purchasing decisions because of their authority, knowledge, position, or relationship with their audience. An influencer is someone who has a following in a distinct niche with whom they actively engage, the size of the following depends on the popularity of their niche. Influencers in social media have built a reputation for their knowledge and expertise on a specific topic. What does an influencer do? Contrary to the popular belief of some, an influencer is not somebody who spends all their time on social media taking selfies and trying to sound important. Influencers have to genuinely influence the behavior of their followers. They have built a reputation for their knowledge and expertise on a specific topic. They make regular posts about that topic on their preferred social media channels and generate large followings of enthusiastic, engaged people who pay close attention to their views. So a little bit of information on influencers and social media influencers, such as the one who helped to advertise the beer in the blue and white can. I'd like to ask you some questions. Are you an influencer? 
I don't mean social media influencer, but you hold influence with those whom you come in contact with. Do you have some influence? Do you not have a lot of influence, perhaps? Should we not all seek to be influencers of others for good with the way of God that we've been taught? Because, you know, you and I, if we're doing our part and led by the Holy Spirit, are subject matter experts who should have influence. In the time we have for the sermon today, I'd like to consider the matter of influence and being an influencer in this context. Because it is clear from Scripture we should influence others. We should influence them in a right way and we should influence them for our good, for their good, for good as defined by God's Word. Influence can be heard, our words. Influence can be seen our actions, what we do. In other words, setting an example. Influence is a natural byproduct of relationships and of communication between parties. That is very much like those articles that I read. Those influencers are in relationships with those that view their videos, that read their material. They communicate and they influence others. We have relationships. We communicate with others. We're going to influence them one way or the other. It's just a natural byproduct. The truth of the matter is we all have influence. We just do. We can say what's helpful and encouraging or what's hurtful and discouraging. We can do that which sets a right example, thereby encourage others to right action, or we can set a wrong example and tear people down if we're not careful. We can influence people for good. We can influence people for evil. God's Word, as I say, certainly addresses the concept of influence, but not with the terms influence or influencer. As we've seen in the sermonette, one of the words is light. Light. God's Word has much to say about light. I'll go through several scriptures with you regarding light. We have long realized in the Church of God that the first time a concept is mentioned in scripture is very important. Let's turn to where light is first mentioned. It's mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. Often the physical Parallels are types, the spiritual. And I think certainly when we understand the scriptures in Genesis 1, that is clearly the case. Genesis 1, we'll start in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was out without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. This great God was actually, we realize, moving to recreate surface of the earth at this point to make it habitable by humanity which he would create shortly and the first thing the first thing that he does is bring about light just as a side point I find it interesting too that he speaks and things come into existence God said let there be light there was light shows his great power, shows his great might. It also shows his intent. Light had to come first. We find light mentioned at the very end of Scripture. Revelation 21 and 22 mention light. 
but say that there is no lamp or light necessary in the New Jerusalem because the Father and the Lamb are the light thereof. God generates light. Spiritually, we find light mentioned. Let's go over to Psalm 119. And we pick up a thought about light in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Path is something one walks in. Walking is a metaphor for how one passes through life. Thus, to have one's path lit by the lamp of God's word indicates one would be moving through life with that word guiding, giving light, showing the way. The thought is continued in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. Proverbs 6, 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. God's commandments give us light. They show us the way to move through life. Let's consider further about the matter of light and its importance and how it's related to being an influencer. Go over to John. The book of John will go to chapter 1 and see what it says of Jesus Christ. We've seen some in the sermonette. We'll go back to those verses actually, but there are some others too I wish to focus on. John chapter 1, starting verse 4, John 1, 4. Speaking of the Word who became Jesus Christ, it says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus Christ came. He was the light of men. He showed the way. He lit the way. He made the proper way of life visible. And yet we see that He came into a dark world that didn't comprehend the example that was set by him. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Jesus Christ's example is there for everyone. To everyone coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. They didn't get it. And most to this day do not get it. They just don't understand how the way of God, as illustrated by Jesus Christ's life, is applicable. But you and I have been given the Holy Spirit. We've been made to know. We've been had our eyes opened to see the light, to understand. I'm going now to John 8, John 8, verse 12, Jesus Christ was in the temple, he was teaching the people, he was interrupted by the Pharisees who brought the woman taken in adultery after he had dealt with that matter. Verse 12, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. He who follows me. Back to the thought of the path. Path is the way one walks through life. And how one follows Christ will determine if they walk in darkness or if they walk in light. Darkness, clearly, the opposite of light, therefore the opposite of the way of God, which is illustrated where Jesus Christ says he is light. He continues with that same thought in John 12. John chapter 12, verse 35. John 12, 35. A little while longer the light is with you. 
Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed was hidden from them. You know, that to me, when I read these scriptures, was reminiscent of something that we used to hear Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong say years ago. If you were in the church in those years, Mr. Armstrong used to say, knowledge is of no value except as it is put to use. Walk while you have the light. While you have that knowledge, you have to put it to use. We have to do something with it. Another concept Mr. Armstrong spoke about, he would tell us, God will only continue to reveal new things to us when we act upon those things he's already revealed to us. New understanding, deeper understanding of truths of God comes when we actually put to use what God has revealed to us. I think we know God has not revealed his truth to just everyone. John 6, Christ said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him. I will raise him up the last day. Not everyone is drawn. Not everyone understands. Not everyone has the light shine through to them. You and I have. You and I have, and we must, of course, do what Jesus Christ said. Walk while we have the light. Going on, verse 44 of this chapter. Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. I've come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. When we follow that light, we're following Jesus Christ, but we are also following the Father, the one who sent Jesus Christ, the one from whom all emanates. Let's consider Luke, what Jesus Christ had to say in Luke the 11th chapter. Goes along with this, Luke the 11th chapter, I'm going to verse 29. Luke 11 in verse 29, while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the son of man will be to this generation. You may want to hold your place here. I'm going to turn to John, the 10th chapter, if you'd like to turn there with me. I'm going to hold my place in Luke because we're coming right back here. But this is interesting. Jesus Christ said that he would be a sign to that generation which he declared to be an evil generation seeking a sign. John 10, verse 22 now, it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. This is what you and I would know as Hanukkah or the Feast of Lights. Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch, and then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And he answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they are witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. He told them, he answered their questions, and they wouldn't believe him. He did works, which he mentions here, that bore witness of him, and they wouldn't receive those either. Thus, this evil generation he speaks of would have the sign of Christ, and they would reject it. Think about what he, the works that he did. He cast out demons. He performed miracles. Cast out demons, and what did they say of him? He cast out the demons by the power of Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. They rejected him. He performed numerous healings, often on the Sabbath. And they rejected him again because he'd done all this hard work on the Sabbath. He didn't fit their criteria. He didn't fit their definition. So they rejected him. Just as he said, he would be a sign to them. They which were an evil generation, they were evil because they rejected his counsel, his teaching, his example. I'm back in Luke 11 now. Continuing in verse 31. 
Jesus Christ says, The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came to the ends of, from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with his generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed, one greater than Jonah is here. The counsel of Solomon was heard. His influence was accepted and heard by the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba. She came, she heard. If we went back to that section of scripture in the Old Testament, it says that she had no more spirit in her when she saw court of Solomon, heard his counsel, and saw all that was done. And she, she glorified God. She said, surely God has set you on the throne of your father David. Men of Nineveh, they heard the counsel, if you will, the influence given by Jonah. I'm going to turn to Jonah, pick up a few verses there. We won't look at the entire story. There's no need to, but I will look at chapter 3 because it makes an important point or two with regard to this matter of influence. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. God got his attention. And the word of God came to him a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. We take, if this is understood correctly, and you will find in commentaries that the meaning of these words are somewhat difficult to understand, but it would seem that the city of Nineveh was so large it took three days to walk across it. Chapter 4, verse 11, God himself said it was a city of more than 120,000 people. A very large city for that age. Jonah began to enter the city, verse 4, on the first day's walk. And then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That is clearly a summary statement of his preaching to them. That was not all he said. You can see the evidence of that when we get down a few more verses to the king's proclamation. Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. In other words, a royal proclamation, a command to the citizenry, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent, turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Obviously, Jonah told them, your works are evil, there's violence in this city, and God is going to deal with it. The king himself admonished them. Who can tell if God will turn and relent, turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? It's the same kind of message we preach in this day. Turn from evil so that God will not punish. There is a call to repentance. Jonah had the same methodology. And he had real influence with them because it came to the people and it came to the king and they did something about it. Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. Real influence. He was able to make a difference. He spoke to them and they took his words to heart. How about us? Don't we oftentimes speak to our friends, our neighbors, our family members. Maybe they ask us questions about our beliefs. They ask us about our behavior. 
as the opportunity to be a light and an influence. I'm going back to chapter 11 of Luke to continue with Christ's words here. After he spoke about the Queen of the South and the men of Nineveh, Luke 11, verse 33, he continues with the same concept. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. Jonah was a light to the Ninevites. Solomon was a light to the Queen of the South. And in like fashion, Christ admonishes those who are listening to him to be a lamp and a light and not to hide that light or put it in a secret place. Verse 34, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. When your eye is bad, your body is also full of darkness. In other words, if you see the light and you accept it, you take it, you put it to use, we and any who we might have influence with, if they see that, if we see that, we're filled with light. We're filled with light and we're walking in that path. But to reject that, the eye is bad. The body's full of darkness. Those that reject the counsel of God will be filled with darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Is not this society characterized by light that has become darkness and vice versa? Evil is proclaimed as good. Good is proclaimed as evil. You can think of any number of aspects of modern living that are that way. Evil is proclaimed to be good. Good is thought to be evil. We live in just such an age. Take heed that the light which is in you is, in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. When we accept that light, or anyone accepts that light, It's like a bright shining lamp it brings life and the possibility of that. I'd like to turn to the Old Testament again. I'm going to go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles about chapter 22. We're looking at a time period that is the last half of the 9th century BC. Approximately 848 to 800 BC, a time of wickedness and turmoil within the nation of Judah. We know, this is about 80 years after the split of the kingdom in the days of Jeroboam and Rehoboam. We know that there was not ever a single ruler of the house of Israel that was a righteous man. None of them were. They all followed after, as the scripture says, the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. They entered into false worship and they went in the wrong path. There were some righteous rulers in Judah. A few. And even some of the few made drastic errors. Asa, Uzziah, made drastic errors. But there were some good rulers in Judah that tried to do right. But the time period we're looking at here is a time when the house of Judah was tied in closely with the house of Israel. There was intermarriage with the household of Ahab, one of the most evil kings of Israel. And they followed after the examples set by Ahab and his Family, look at chapter 22 of 2 Chronicles, verse 1. It says, Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his place, for the raiders who had come with the Arabians into the camp had killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Ahaziah was 42 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. They were married in not only to Ahab's house, but into Omri's house. Omri was one of the earlier kings of Israel. And Athaliah was the granddaughter of that Omri. 
Verse 3, he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly. Therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. And verse 5 says he also followed their advice. So you have the house of Judah in a time of spiritual decline. How great was that spiritual decline? Look at... Verse 9, the last sentence, I'm starting the last sentence of verse 9, says, So the house of Ahaziah had no one to assume power of the kingdom when he died. Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. She took it upon herself to murder the royal heirs so that she could grab the reins of power and become queen in Judah. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered and put him and his nurse in his bedroom. He said that there was no one to assume power over the kingdom. Ahaziah had an infant son, a year old or less. Obviously, he wouldn't have come to the throne in power yet. But this woman, Jehoshaphat, daughter of the king, took him stole him away from the king's sons who were being murdered, put him in his, and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, she was the wife of the high priest as well. For she was sister of Ahaziah, hid him, Joash, from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. He was hidden with him in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Athaliah reigned as a queen for six years in Judah. And she and her sons, we find elsewhere in the scripture, did great damage to the temple. They broke into the temple. They stole all of the golden items and the utensils from the temple and took them to the house of Baal. They were Baal worshipers. But this woman and her husband, the high priest, hid Joash in the temple. Ultimately, Jehoiada, the high priest, at the age of seven, for Joash anointed him to become king and placed him on the throne of David, whose descendant he was. And they seized Athaliah and executed her. And where I'm going with this in context of influence is this man, Jehoiada, the high priest. He was a true, good, and righteous man and had great influence throughout the tribe of Judah and with the Levites. Look at chapter 23, starting verse 16. It says, Then Jehoiada made a covenant between himself, the people, and the king, that they should be the Lord's people. He was trying to turn them back to the true worship, which they had strayed from. And all the people went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. They broke in pieces its altars and images. They killed Matin, the priest of Baal, before the altars. Also Jehoiada appointed the oversight of the house of the Lord to the hand of the priests, the Levites whom David had assigned in the house of the Lord to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord as is written in the law of Moses with rejoicing and singing as it was established by David. The wording obviously indicates they had fallen away from the true worship and he was reestablishing it. He set gatekeepers at the gates of the house of the Lord so that no one who was in any way unclean should enter in. Then he took the captains of hundreds, the nobles, the governors of the people, and all the people of the land, and brought the king down from the house of the Lord, and they went through the upper gate to the king's house and set the king on the throne of the kingdom. So all the people of the land rejoiced. The city was quiet, for they had slain Athaliah with a sword. This wicked individual, who with her sons had done great damage to the temple, and in a day when the people were already straying from God, this man Jehoiada had great influence. And he turned the nation around. He turned the priesthood and the Levites around so that they started doing the job they had been assigned all along. I'm continuing in verse 1 of chapter 24. Joash was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. 
As long as Jehoiada was around, Joash did what was right. If we were to continue on, we won't go verse by verse. You'll see that Joash himself came to have great zeal for the restoration of the temple and temple worship. The Levites didn't act fast enough and he prided them on so that the true worship was restored. But there's a problem. Verse 2 indicates it with its wording. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada had such great influence. But, verse 15, Jehoiada grew old and was full of days and he died. He was 130 years old when he died. They buried him in the city of David among the kings. That was not done. That was not something that was normally done to bury the priest, the high priest, amongst the kings. That was a separate area. They did, though, buried him among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and his house. The next verse tells the story. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, the leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king, and the king listened to them. Therefore, they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers, served wooden images and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. As long as Jehoiada was alive, he was a light, an example, and he carried great influence. But once he was gone, once he had died, they turned away from the true God again. You know, there have to be people of influence to set the way before others, to light the light and keep the light lit. I submit to you that God has called you and me for just such service, to set the right example, to light the path and the way. Going to Matthew now, book of Matthew chapter 5, we'll look at these verses that Mr. Hahn covered again. Chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 14, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. If we are the light, we are to be seen. That's what light does. It's seen. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. The light is out in the open. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. An admonition to all Jesus Christ's disciples through the ages to be a light and an example that God may have glory. Technical note, one I find very interesting about chapter 5, verse 15. In the King James it reads, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick and it gives light unto all that are in the house. That is an absolute wrong translation and is an absolute wrong concept. The word candle. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words in its entry on the word lamp gives us its final note this comment. There is no mention of a candle in the original either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. The figure of that which feeds upon its own substance to provide its light would be utterly inappropriate. A lamp is supplied by oil, which is in its symbolism figurative of the Holy Spirit. Mr. Vine understood. The lamp, the light, comes from oil of the Holy Spirit. You and I don't do this of ourselves. To truly influence others, as a light, it has to come from God. And God will guide us in that. And he'll bring us to the attention of others. My wife and I were discussing this concept. And she brought up an incident that uh, I hadn't thought of in some time, but I knew the story. My father-in-law has been dead for some years now. He was a genuine good man. He was in the Worldwide Church of God many years ago. And he took his family year by year 
to the Feast of Tabernacles. In those years, they generally went to Mount Pocono, Pennsylvania, which is a beautiful area if you've ever been there for the feast or otherwise. If you've ever been there, you also know it can be rather high priced because Pocono Mountain is sort of a playground for those in New York City. They go there and they've got money, right? Drives the price up. So he would go there and it was known at his place of employment that he was taking his family to some kind of a religious observance and they go to Mount Pocono, Pennsylvania. So one of his co-workers asks him one day, Lee, how is it that you can afford to take your family to such a nice area? How is it that you can afford to go there for so long? And my father-in-law explained, that he took 10% of his salary, paycheck by paycheck by paycheck through the year, and saved that, the second tithe, as you and I know it. And he had sufficient funds on hand to stay in a very nice hotel, go to the finest restaurants, and go to see some of the attractions in the area. And if his wife and children saw some item they might like, he could buy it and give it as a gift to them. And he explained all of this to the man. And the man that was his coworker was so impressed that he said he was going to do the same thing, and it turns out he did. Now, he didn't keep the festival days. He never came into the church. But the man benefited his family by living a principle out of the Scripture of God. He brought a benefit. My father-in-law was an influencer. He influenced this man to do something that benefited him and something that's going to come back to the man one day. Turn with me to 1 Peter, the second chapter. First Peter, the second chapter. Verse 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. We abstain, we stay away from those things that God says are not to be done. Having your conduct honorable amongst the Gentiles. Gentiles here understood really as those that are unconverted. Your conduct will be honorable amongst them. That when they speak against you as evildoers, and they will, they will speak against us as evildoers, not because we're doing evil, but we're out of step with the way they live in this world and that looks evil to them. They will speak against us as evildoers. They may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. And when will their day of visitation be for most people that we have surrounding us in this society that are going the way of the world? Will it not be generally in the great white throne judgment? in the general resurrection, that's probably when it will be. It will be their day of visitation, the vast majority of them. And it says in that day, they're going to glorify God. This is all going to come back. They're going to put it together and make sense of it. And they're going to understand that that guy or that girl that seemed so odd and did these things and seemed out of step and we thought they were so very wrong. Turns out that they were right. How would you like to influence somebody a thousand years from now? Do it right now and a thousand years from now they'll come back. It doesn't make it easy now. But it's the principle that's in the scriptures. In their day of visitation, They'll glorify God over these things that you and I have set a right example in and in which we have influenced them. Going over to the next chapter, 1 Peter 3, verse 15. They, they see our works, but they can also hear what we have to say. Some of them will ask. You may have been asked yourself. I've been asked. Why do you do these things? Why do you go to these Jewish seeming days? Why do you not eat these certain things? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? We have the opportunity also to influence them with our words. And here in verse 15 of chapter 3, we find it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. King James says, Give an answer. 
The word here, if you look in the commentaries, is actually a legal term used in Greek legal circles, and it does mean a defense. But it also can mean, as it says in the King James, an answer, a reasoned statement or argument. You answer and give a reasoned answer as to why you're doing what you're doing. We tell people, and it has an influence. You know, we may not know just how much influence we have with others. Your neighbors, co-workers, family members, they may not really reveal their inmost thoughts. But our example, our words, can be very important, very influential, very persuasive. They can have influence. Sometimes now, sometimes a long way down the road. But that's how God would have us to do things, to set the example, to be lights, to have influence. You and I are called to be lights. We are called to have influence, though we may not be called influencers in the sense of the word, certainly not in the sense of the word is now used in the world of the internet or the world of corporate advertising, but we can and should have influence and show forth the way of God. We are to be lights to this world, examples, and ultimately bring glory to God. He wants us to have influence, and he has given us his spirit and understanding and a way of life which can have that influence. I'll simply close with Jesus Christ's words that we read earlier in Luke, the 11th chapter, verse 33, wherein he said, No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. Let us all, brethren, be such lights and have influence with those around us.